In this video, I'm going to take you through the beginning stages of building our high tunnel research project, starting with site selection considerations. Determining where to place the high tunnel is the first step. I don't have a lot of wide open level spaces, so options can be limited. One of, if not the most important, consideration is light. It is the energy source that gets our plants growing and the source of heat energy that will be stored in the climate battery and concrete block wall. Next is water. I have a fairly unique option. I have a natural spring uphill from this location, which provides a gravity fed source of water. And finally, electricity to run equipment, such as fans, motors for the roll up fence, or possibly lights. Fortunately, it was possible to tap into the adjacent greenhouse's electrical supply. Several trees were either located right where the high tunnel was to be built or cast detrimental shadows onto the future high tunnel. They had to go. In general, deciduous trees that drop their leaves in the wintertime don't block as much light as coniferous trees. I like to use an app on my phone called Sun Position, which can do a live overlay of the sun's path across the sky any time of the year. It's always a bit surprising how low it really is in the horizon during the wintertime. On this image, it's showing December 22nd, which would be the lowest path across our horizon. Now it's time to dig. A large excavator was brought in to make short work of the project. Once they were shown the layout, they got to work. The hole was oversized a few feet to allow room for us to work on items around the outside. I always find it surprising how unlevel the natural grade is. I am planning to bring in fill to build up the far end and slope drainage away from the structure. Now for the climate battery pipes. This here illustration shows that on the inlet side, we used non-perforated pipe and then transitioned to perforated pipe across the bottom of the heat exchanger and up out the exhaust. Here's how we splice the tubes together. We cut a slit, slid the pipes together, and then twist a wire around them. This was just spare electric fence wire that I had. It only needs to hold together through backfilling and settling. The target tube spacing was 16 inches horizontally with two layers the bottom layer at four foot depth and the upper at two foot depth. I don't like pipes to be any shallower than that because I may hit them when I'm pounding in my trellising posts and I want a safe distance when I'm tilling. We used these garden stakes as temporary holders to keep the pipes in place when backfilling. Two types of tubing were used in the construction. First, a solid four inch corrugated and then a perforated pipe. Each length was measured, laid out, cut, sliced, a couple of corrugations, overlapped, connected, and affixed using wire. It's important that the inlet side of the pipe by the fan be solid or a substantial amount of air will exit the walls of the pipe instead of traveling down the length of the pipe. The floppy nature of the tubes required supporting the wires to keep them vertical on the walls. It did not take long to figure out that the tubes moved excessively when backfilling. Stakes were pounded into the ground at the desired spacing to alleviate this issue. After they were covered, we pulled the stakes to reuse them. To avoid driving over the pipe, we laid out six at a time, staked them, and then we covered them. And then we do that again with the next six. Instead of the standard posts, we used ground stains, which are posts with a plate welded on the bottom to prevent sinking under load pulling out in weather events. The ground stands are laid out in the typical four foot spacing, except for the end walls, as shown in this illustration. To maintain spacing, they are fixed to the lower wooden baseboard of the tunnel. Four inches of EPS foam board was used as insulation for this climate battery. The assembled ground stands, baseboard, and insulation will look like this. This baseboard attaches to the pipes like any other high tunnel kit. It both prevents unwanted intruders, helps maintain four foot spacing, and provides attachment of the wiggle wire channel later to hold the film. The in ground insulation consists of two layers of two inch foam board and ties directly to the baseboard. I always make sure to stagger the seams of the foam board. Adding additional securing points can be made by pressing wire through the foam board and wrapping around small pieces of wood. The wood prevents the wire from pulling through the foam when tightened. With the first layer of tubes laid, the next step was to place the ground stands on the east and the south sides. 
the west side would go in last to allow the tractor to fill over the second layer of tubes. Corner braces were also used to maintain the squareness of the high tunnel. Make sure these are in the correct location. Correcting them after they're buried is not an easy task. Two layers of foam were attached to the inside of the baseboards. We attached a strap of duct tape to temporarily hold things together during backfilling. Filling the dirt back in proved a challenge. A careful balance of dirt on the inside of the foam to the outside was necessary. Laying the second row of tubes proved to be much easier. They were interleaved with the bottom row so that every other tube is shown at an alternating depth. I had a series of fiberglass posts in the ground that I could use later to insert thermocouples into the ground for data collection without hitting a pipe. They were a little cumbersome to navigate around when backfilling. We were excited to be close to done with the backfilling. Overall, 84 runs of 4-inch pipe were buried. We'll come back later to cut them to the right length on both ends. Once the battery was filled with enough dirt to permit the loader to dump without entering the hole, the west end could be constructed. Due to the grade slope, a significant amount of dirt was needed to be brought in to backfill the exterior of the west side. The tubes were left at full length and cut off later until the surrounding structure was completed. Check out the prior video on building the ultimate high tunnel for cold climates to see the frame assembly. The pipes were then all cut to similar height. Orange spray paint was used to differentiate between the upper and the lower layers. It's a common myth that the intake side of the climate battery should extend up to the peak to pull in the warmest air. That is only true in undersized systems that don't have enough airflow to break up temperature stratification. Next, fans were installed on each tube. I originally thought I had found a supplier of a 120 millimeter fan to four inch pipe adapter that would work, but it didn't fit these corrugated pipes. I ended up 3D printing my own design out of ABS plastic. Power and control wiring was then added and it was ready to blow. If you're interested in doing this yourself, here's the general wiring schematic that I used for the thermostats and the power for the fans. The climate battery is now operational. This configuration doesn't use any manifolds. I would not necessarily recommend this for regular use as it requires a lot of wiring and assembly versus a manifold system. However, it is an excellent design for research purposes and reconfiguration down the road. I will cover the results and performance of this system in a future video. This video was funded in part by USDA's South Dakota Specialty Crop Block Grant. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a thumbs up and share it with your friends. I'd also love to know your thoughts. Comment down below and let's chat. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe for more content like this.